morning. Good Hello, Hello, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, before we go and pray and, and get to the Word, I had the opportunity of bringing the Word of God this morning, and I'm always thankful um, when I get to do so. And um, I just want to just, before we go to prayer, just want to say that um, my wife and I, and you guys, most of you know who Julie is, what a, what a gracious God the Lord has been to me. And we had the chance last weekend to go to Bellevue to a, uh, a weekend to remember marriage seminar and this and that. And my only regret is I wish we would have done it years ago. And I, I would just say, if anyone's out there that, you know, you've been married, looking to get married or whatever, those sort of things are really good to go to from time to time. Just to refocus and remember why you made the commitment to begin with and to remember how important marriage is to the Lord. Um, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And the other thing I'm very thankful is um, the mere fact that I get a chance to share the word of God with you this morning is a testimony to the faithfulness of the Lord. Because maybe not like you, but I can surely say for me, I'm a knucklehead, and there have been many times I would have gone astray without his rod and his staff. Yeah, yeah, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. I think we're honest with ourselves. We, uh, we all need a little bit of a rod and staff from time to time. Um, let's pray. Let me remove my hair real quick. Lord, I thank you so much for this time, and Lord, I ask that the words that I speak will be your words spoken through your servant and nothing more. And Lord, I just pray that you will open up your word. Holy Spirit, that you will illumine our hearts. And Lord, that at this point, that heaven would be, that you would open the heavens of understanding to us here that are on earth. And uh, Father, that we would realize that surrounding us is the spiritual realm. Though we cannot see it, we know it's there. And Lord, bless us and keep us. Bind the enemy during this time. And Lord, open our eyes, our hearts, and our ears. In Jesus' name, amen. This is, um, this is a message that I've wanted to give um, probably for 10 years. And it, it, it actually came to me in the middle of an AP Advanced Placement Human Geography class at Union High School. Um, for those that don't know me, I, I, I am a school teacher. Um, I'm also a graduate of Multnomah. Very, very, it, it was great. Loved going there and everything like that. And um, advanced placement, um, AP Human Geography is a course that teaches world systems. Um, why, how human beings interact with the surface of the earth. Basically, you're able to explain why are there, the developed nations exist and the least developed nations exist, our food systems, language, um, religion uh, patterns across the world. It's just to look at a systems on the earth. And one of the things that I, and I'm also a historian, a history teacher, one of the things that I find very, very important in the classroom when you teach history is helping students and human beings understand the context in which they live. Yeah, let me let me let me just illustrate this. We know that words derive their meaning from context, correct? Now we're creatures, and we inhabit time which has a past, present, and future. Which means if I were to, and I'm gonna give this assignment in a couple of weeks to my sophomores. If I were to have you write on a piece of paper and mark a check box, box every time that in your mind or you heard someone refer to either the past, present, and future for 24 hours, put a check mark on the, on the piece of paper. Every single time that your mind goes to the past, present, or future, and what you will find is something self-evident, you would have no room left on that paper. We are creatures that need context. We're finite. Now, the most important context we receive in life is making sure we understand who God is. Because we cannot understand who we are unless we understand who He is first. That's true. 
But another context that we need is we need to understand time. Now, this is the Word of God. And the author of this, if you really seriously look at it, must be outside of time. I, if you're not a believer in Jesus, I'm going to make a wee bit of a suggestion to you. Must be important, I'm going into my accent, which I don't have it. <laughs> but I'm going to make a wee bit of a suggestion to you. Do you really want to know the truth? Because if you do, you're going to look. This book has been attacked like no other book in history, and it stands. If you truly want to know that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, we read the passage from Isaiah 53. Folks, it says he'll be wounded. In Psalm 22, it says he's going to be pierced. Ladies and gentlemen, those were written before the Roman Empire was even started and developed crucifixion. The God of the Bible is outside of time. He knows the end from the beginning. In fact, the truth is, Every moment that will ever exist in this universe is all before God all at once. If you're born again, he chooses to not dwell on our failures and our sin. But God is outside of time. If he wasn't, he couldn't know everything. So should we be surprised that he would give us a book that carefully looked at and studied at would give us a picture of the times we live in? I hope by the end of this message that you will understand a little bit more of the context that we find ourselves in. And I think I, sh I should think right now that all of us know that the world changed a few years ago. So I hope I have the honor to share with you what I believe to be the truth here. I want to go back to Genesis chapter 11, to the Tower of Babel. This is the last time in Scripture that God intervened on the planet to deal with all of humanity at once. We find in chapter 12, he's going to deal with Abram, who was changed to Abraham, who had a son named Isaac, then Jacob, and Israel. And we're going to find that God is going to deal with Israel and then the church. But the last time he dealt with humanity as a whole, you've got to remember in Genesis chapter 11, there is no Jewish people yet. was the Tower of Babel. And there are times in the scriptures when statements are made that you just circle and you underline and go, that's, that's important. It's all important, but that, that, that really helps. So let's take a look at Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth, first of all, let me preface it by saying this. After, this is after the flood isn't it ironic that we all know that this planet has gone through some pretty horrific things in the past and scientists come up with the most bizarre explanations and yet they won't look at the historical and cultural uh, evidence that actually says every ancient culture believed in the universal flood? I don't know, I digress. <laughs> it's just poor scholarship. To ignore evidence is poor scholarship. But if they allow it, then they have to allow a flood story, and that implies, yeah. I thought it was about education. Well, I digress. Anyway, God told them to fill the earth and multiply and not gather in one place. That was the command. They didn't do it. Let's take a look. Now, the whole earth was used the same language and the same words. You underlined that. Same language, same words, which means there was a universal language, which means they could all talk to each other. There are some things very, very true that you need to understand. If we all speak the same language and talk to each other, we can all learn a lot of different things and share a lot of different ideas. It came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly, and use bricks for stone, and they used tar and mortar. 
They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad in the face of the whole earth. Now, they know exactly what they're doing. And may I, I, I want to go quickly through this because I want to get to some other places. But let's be very, very clear what they're doing. They're using their technology, their brain power, their technology to disobey God. God said, scatter what's almost the exact opposite. Settle in one place and let's build a tower up to heaven. And they know what they're doing. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold. I love that word. Behold. They are one people and they all have the same what? Language. And this is what they begin to do? Now listen to the next statement and think about how profound this is. This is coming from the mouth of the Lord. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Make no mistake about it, folks. When God created human beings and made them in his image and likeness, he gave them a lot. And we're fallen. But do you see that statement? Anything they set their minds to do, they will be able to what? Do. Do you guys see that? That is, I underlined that one. So what did the Lord do? Well, Come, let us go down and confuse their what? Languages, so that they will not understand one another's speech. And then the Lord scattered them. What the Lord did, and, and all of us living in the United States, I think we all understand the, the concept of checks and balances. We're used to that when we learn civics, right? The Constitution checks and balances, and they're all there to prevent sinfulness from getting out of hand. Does that make sense? Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is check and balance. The Lord is saying, look, their technology, they're using it to defy it. I'm going to confuse their languages, and I'm going to scatter them, and I'm going to put a barrier of them sharing knowledge and information with them. I'm going to slow this down, the flow of technology. Are we good so far? All right. Now... Would we go to question two so that uh, should, should I should say question two um, there. This is what hit me. First year I was teaching AP Human Geography, I was telling my kids how to write FRQs, free response questions. Um, the people that publish AP um, questions or the AP exams is called College Board. They're the same people that did the PSATs and do the SATs. They are not a Christian organization. Can I just leave it at that? And they run all eight advanced placement programs. If you're an AP teacher, you basically teach what College Board says to teach, okay? Now, this is question number two from like the 2015 exam, I think. I could be wrong there. English is the most widely used language in the world, thus becoming the world's lingua franca. Define the term lingua franca, identify and describe one historical factor that contributed to worldwide use of English, identify and explain two examples that show how globalization is contributing to English becoming the world's lingua franca. Folks, what they just said from Secular College Board is there is one language on the planet that we're using to communicate with, thus what the Lord did at Babel has been, in you see it? Do you see it? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> now, listen. It doesn't matter. I'm an experienced school teacher. This happens all the time. <laughs> this is usually when I throw chalk. All right, now, listen. Yes, we have multiple languages on the planet, but can we be very blunt and honest that there's just pretty much nowhere, anywhere, everywhere you go on the planet, you're going to run into English? 
Now, I don't have the slides up, but let me show you a couple of things, okay? In this particular answer, they asked the students to define lingua franca. It doesn't mean that we have one language on the planet now. Do you understand that? It just means we have one that we can use to communicate. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? The number one spoken language on the earth that you're born with is Mandarin Chinese. But the number one spoken second language of the world is English. Okay? And there's reasons for that. So first, they wanted to give a definition. And could you go down to the next side that says Part B? Okay, so in Part B, they wanted the students to explain how in the world did this happen? How did English become the lingua franca? It doesn't mean everyone speaks English on the earth. It just means can we communicate freely? Number one, the British Empire. The sun never set on the British Empire, ladies and gentlemen. They diffused English around the world. And then after the British Empire, the United States became the world power. Does that make sense? And what language did the United States speak? Folks, in 1945, the United States had 6% of the world's population and 50% of its wealth. Never in history has any nation stood at the pinnacle before. Does that make sense? And John, if it's not going to work, let's just leave it. I can proceed without it. Okay. Okay. Now, listen. The point of the matter is, if you look at history from the British to the United States, English has spread around the planet. Now, there were other reasons why this exists. But if you're an airline pilot and you know that if you fly internationally, all orders and commands in the cockpit are in English. They have to be. You can't have 50 different languages being spoken if you're flying into Dubai. Does that make sense? Now, ladies and gentlemen, movies, music, and everything. So as English became the dominant language on the planet that we use. I'm not saying it's better. I before E except after C, so many exceptions. <laughs> the point of the matter is, when I was teaching AP Human Geography, I was teaching my students that the check and balance of the Tower of Babel was no longer there. Now, let's get more contemporary. This change is relatively recent in the last 30 to 40 years. What's some of the results of this? Well, one, the explosion of knowledge in the last 10 years. Do you see it? Do you see it? In Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, Daniel was concluding, getting ready to wrap up the prophecies, and he was given a lot of prophecies that were really, really wild. And Daniel was an old man at that time going, what, 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 what's it all mean? And the angel said to him, Daniel, close the book. It's not for your time. And then Daniel was told that in the end, let me read it for you, what Daniel 12, 1 through 4 said. And speaking about the end. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over your sons or your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress, such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time, and at that time your people. Which means it's going to get worse than even what World War II was. Everyone who's found written in the book will be rescued, the book of life. 
Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will wake, some to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness in the expanse of heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And, but here, look, listen to verse 4. But you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Until the end of time, what the angel just, what the Lord said was, this book will be opened. You ready? There are two statements made that can only be true as a result of the diffusion of English. You ready? But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. The two marks of the end of the age that are said here is that many will go back and what? Ladies and gentlemen, that's globalization. I can be in Italy in 16 hours. Never in the history of mankind have we traversed the planet back and forth. Does that make sense? Globalization and look at the knowledge. You guys see it? How many of you know that there's so much new knowledge out there that we can't even keep straight what's factual anymore? Anybody up here? How many of you are aware that fake news was something we didn't even know about 10 years ago? You with me on that, right? Right? Here's the paradox. The more that we have the explosion of knowledge and sharing things back and forth across the planet, the less we actually can hold on to. This is why I suggest that the Bible is the only thing to hold on to. But let's just think for a second as a school teacher. Do we now have apps where you literally can say something in one language and then it transfers it to another language? Now, something has happened um, for me as a teacher that I have to do this afternoon. And not this afternoon, that would be a long afternoon. This summer... Um, chat GTP, the AI, you guys have heard of that, correct? Chat GPT has come out where you literally can ask it any question and it will basically write your answer. You guys know what I'm talking about? Artificial intelligence. Um, I have to go back and read tool everything in my classroom because I'm not even sure if a student brings something from home, whether a machine wrote it or a human being wrote it. That's the fact. Now we've got where we're talking about machines doing things that it was science fiction. Now we're talking about robotics doing things that Spock never dreamed of. We're also on the cusp of virtual reality when those glasses become available and they're inexpensive and work. I could see it now in the 1980s as a parent, you would say, you're grounded, go to your room. Worst place you'd want to go to in the 80s. Nothing to do. Now it's put your phone away and go outside. Ride a bike. Go play with a friend. See somebody physically. Right? In 10 years, are going to be, will you put those glasses off and get back to reality? Ladies and gentlemen, in Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, Paul is talking about the return of the Lord. And he says this, now, as to the time and epochs, time periods, brothers, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Are you referring to the rapture there? Why are they, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape which means it's going to be whatever that is is going to affect the globe. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day would overtake you like a thief. 
For you are sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness, but then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. What the Lord basically is saying, and this is, what I'm, this is the main point I was trying to say during this time. And I apologize a little bit of my losing my technology there, kind of. It's ironic talking about technology and it breaks on you. It's hilarious. But here's the thing, folks. When God talks about the, the return of the Lord, obviously we know very well we're not to sit there and set dates, right? But the Lord was very, very concerned that we understood the times we live in. For many will come in the end of the age. The scoffer says, where's this, where's this coming? Many have been saying this. Life goes on as it was. But the truth of the matter is, folks, that day is approaching. And can I just suggest to you from Scripture one very categorical reason why? Anything I say from up here, test it by the Word of God, please. I'm just a human being. But if God entered time to scatter, to confuse our languages, to prevent us from destroying ourselves with our technology, and that in the process of time has been eradicated, how much time will it take before he once again steps into time and says it's over? Now that emphasize what I was saying. Do you guys understand what I just said? If God intervened at a point and said, your technology, you speak one language, I'm going to confuse your language, just scatter. I'm going to slow this down. And through the passage of time, we have now become a planet where we can converse again. And we're watching our science and technology explode, which the Lord said would happen. And we're watching technology develop that will truly change the way we even live as human beings. Let me just digress. With chat AI, I will no longer know as a teacher whether it comes from a human being unless they're sitting in front of me. I will, there's coming a day where I won't even know if that song was produced by a machine. Or that person speaking on the internet is real because Microsoft now has technology where they can hear your voice and then create an algorithm to make a video of you. you do you, you guys understand that the older I get, the more I'm relying on this because I just don't know what's real in my culture because I'm overloaded with so much. And this has not happened slowly. This has happened what? It's quickly. Anybody with me on this? Has anybody just went, what is going on? What I'm suggesting to you is this. I don't know the exact time our Lord returns. I will tell you this. If having one language was important for him to intervene in the past, by golly, it probably is important for him to intervene again. Because we're thinking of some really crazy stuff now. And you know, I know what you're thinking. Well, you must be a kook thinking, no, I haven't even, no. All I'm saying is there are things now happening that 10 years ago, if I said they would happen, you'd think I was nuts. We are at the end of the age. Our Lord returns. We don't know when, what year, but folks, it's here. Israel is a nation. The powers are being shaken around the world. All I want to do with my life from this point on is just tell you, get ready. For me, whatever I've got to repent of, the Lord is going to return. And here's the thing. You ready? Why does God take all this time to tell us these things? So that we as a church would know the times we live in. We all know Things are changing. This is not the time to play church. This is the time to be sober, to be busy.
It's time to be evangelist. It's time for you to share. Because the truth is, could you imagine not knowing Jesus and living in this world? Our countrymen need to know. Pray for the revivals. Pray. Pray that what God is starting will continue to grow. Pray. Because there's nothing you've done, there's nothing I've done that God won't forgive. He loves us. He told us knowledge would explode. He told us these things so that we would know. These are and truly are exciting days. It could go on another 20 years, but I don't know what this world's going to be like in 20. Do you? In closing, I will say this. If you're a non-believer, you don't know Jesus, and you got a lot of questions, do you want to know? Ask the questions. Raise your hand in fear if you would just give your two front teeth to ever talk to a person inquiring about Jesus and share your story with them. Raise your hand if you're sitting here right now. There's nothing that you've done or I've done or anyone's done that the Lord won't forgive. He loves us. He loves us. And by the way, this message is not to be, this message is not to be like, ooh, fear and, and scare. No, this message, the purpose of this message is to say, folks, I'm trying to help you understand the times we live in. And the reason why we're seeing all this go around is because the Tower of Babel. We have one universal language that's being used. Of course we should see explosion of knowledge. It makes sense. And technology. But as we see humanity racing to play God with technology, we need to get on our knees and humble ourselves and start asking God to show them the truth. The last thing I want to say as believers, I used to think I was smart. Oscar Wilder, I'm not young enough to know everything anymore. It is good. That's what I thought when I uh, read his quote. I'm not young enough to know everything. I will tell you this. This is the only thing to stand on. And on every page is Jesus Christ. I don't say that because I'm supposed to say it, even though I am supposed to say it. I'm saying it because it's... We, when we preach sermons, when we tell you these things, is because we want you to be aware of the times we live in. Does that make sense? And the world does recognize this. So the passages, again, in Scripture were Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, Genesis 11, 1 Thessalonians. And here's the thing that I would say for you, and I'll close with this. I promise this time I will close. Nobody is insignificant in this room. No one is beyond being used by the Lord for good. For the believer, when we see these days coming, we look up and we rejoice. Maranatha. Our Lord returns. And when he does, 
Until then, know the times. Be sober. And by the way, when it says be sober, it wasn't just talking about I'm not, I'm not getting alcohol. It just means when you're sober, you're alert. Does that make sense? Be alert. Know your times. If you've got something, find somebody. Confess it. Get it off your... Just lay it down. I think the best prayer I ever said to the Lord was, how in the world did I ever get here? And he says, well... And I think the next thing I said was, help. And guess what? He did. 